Thanks, Rob. Um, and thank you. Roger was about to step in and give my slides, so I'm sure he was quite pleased to see me. Um, I was one of the eight lead authors on the Australasian chapter, which covers Australia and New Zealand. One of my fellow lead authors I see in the audience, Penny Wetton, is just over there. So if there's any really difficult questions about climate, I'll hand over to Penny. Uh, I'll just go through the key messages. Is that on? Is that all right? Okay. Uh, rather quickly, the key messages so that we can get to questions. First key message, of course, Australia's climate is changing and it's changing uh, in a consistent way with the global picture. Air temperature has increased about 0.09 degrees per decade uh, over about the past 100 years. Greatest warming over the inland regions and less over the coastal regions. Hot extremes are increasing cold extremes are decreasing and this trend is especially obvious since the 1960s. Our oceans are warming and the southern ocean in particular is a global warming hotspot for the oceans. Rainfall is changing but in different ways in different parts of the country. It's actually increasing up in the northwest but it has declined in the southwest and the southeast and much of the east coast. Uh, but at the same time, we've had increases in the duration of extreme rainfall events, and it's, of course it's these sorts of events that lead to flooding. Sea levels around Australia are very, very variable, uh, but if you average them out, they're rising at about the global average of just over three millimetres per annum, and snow is declining. It's declining um, in the snow mountains, it's declined about 10% per decade since the 1960s. Second key message, Australia's climate will continue to change as expected through the 21st century. Uh, if we have a look at these graphs, that's the, the, the black line is the observed temperature uh, change, the uh, purple band is what you would expect just from natural variability in the climate system. Under a very strong emissions reduction scenario, um, we would expect that blue band of temperature by the end of this century, and under a business as usual scenario known as the RCP 8.5, for those of you uh, familiar with IPCC sort of acronyms, uh, that red band is what we can expect um, by the end of this century. Uh, we're looking at about 1.5, possibly up to 5 degrees, depending on the emissions scenario by the end of the century, um, between 1 and about 2.5 degrees uh, in the oceans, with hot extremes um, increasing um, as before. If you look at those top two maps um, uh, under the more realistic business as usual scenario, uh, you can see the sorts of Australia we could get um, in the second half of this century. If we translate that into potential heat exposure in different parts of the country, um, this map shows days per year over 40 degrees, uh, with the, the reddest at 130 to 192. So here we are in 1990, 2050, and 2100. And if we translate that into person days, that is multiplying the number of days by the number of people in the particular region, uh, we can see that Western Australia in particular, person days uh, are getting very, very hot towards the end of this century. Uh, but, and the reason that Tasmania is very short, small, of course, is that there's not many persons there. Um, <laughs> Tasmania will still get hot, though of course it'll be cooler than anywhere else in the country. Uh, rainfall will remain rather difficult to predict and this raises particular challenges for the sorts of adaptation measures that we need to address. So you can just see by that map that there's colours all over the place, but once again it's expected that the drying trend that we have seen in the southern parts is more likely than not to continue, uh, but uh, a challenging set of predictions and I'll come back to that when I talk about key risks. Sea levels will continue to rise, not just this century, but for centuries thereafter, possibly at a slightly higher rate than the global average. Uh, drying in conjunction with increases in temperature will continue to increase bushfire danger index. We may get either a 
stable or a reduction in the number of tropical cyclones, but those that do arise are likely to be more intense, and we're waiting to see what Cyclone Ida is going to do in the next couple of days. Uh, it's at the moment a Category 4, uh, and our snow will continue to decline with the prospect of a snow-free snowy mountains by the end of this century. Australia is very, very vulnerable. Despite being a developed country, a wealthy country with high levels of education and a great medical system, recent extreme events, of which I'm just giving a couple of examples, demonstrate how vulnerable we nonetheless are. Queensland floods in 2011 cost 35 lives and up to $6 billion worth of damage to public infrastructure. The 2009 heat wave here in Victoria 300 excess deaths from heat conditions uh, which preceded the 200 lost lives in the Black Saturday bushfires. Another key message is that without significant and effective adaptation and mitigation, we can expect to see significant future impacts across all sectors, water resources, infrastructure, coasts, biodiversity, health and agriculture. And I'm sure Roger covered this as well in his talk. It's a, it's a general theme throughout the report. Um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere already lock us into significant uh, warming and climatic change in the first half of this century, but emissions reductions in the short term will make a big difference to uh, what sort of climate we have in the second half of this century. Finally, we identified in the chapter eight key risks to the Australasian region, um, and we put these into three different buckets depending on the relative value of strong mitigation and strong adaptation, as you'll see in a moment. The first two risks are those that can be delayed somewhat, but are extremely unlikely to be completely avoided because we are already seeing regime shifts um, on the Great Barrier Reef and uh, Ningaloo Reef, so coral reefs in general, uh, and we will almost certainly get loss of mountaintop ecosystems and increased extinctions of native species. That's in train already. The second set of risks are those that uh, have the potential to be severe, but may be reduced substantially with globally effective mitigation strategies combined with effective local adaptation, and these are increased damage due to flooding, reduced water resources, particularly in the southern regions, increased mortality, morbidity and damage to infrastructure in heat waves in southern Australia, and increased damage and loss of life due to bushfires. And then the last two risks we identified are those whose severity um, is a little bit unknown yet, but is likely to be severe if the more extreme end of the projections are realised. So firstly, damage to coastal infrastructure and low-lying coastal systems if the higher end of the sea level rise projections are realised. And lastly, reduction in agricultural production in the Murray-Darling and in the far southwest and southeast if the dry if the high end of the drying scenarios are also realised. Last key message, adaptation is already occurring in Australia and it's probably occurring more effectively here than in many other parts of the world. Um, so there's been significant increases in adaptation efforts since the fourth assessment report published in 2007, but hampered by lack of integration across different levels of government and other sorts of institutional and other barriers, also hampered by great variability in the understanding and appreciation of the risks due to climate change. Some adaptation options with co-benefits, particularly in energy and water use, are already being implemented, which is a good news story. Planning for reduced water availability in southern Australia and for sea level rise in coastal planning is underway, but as many of you will know, implementation is extremely piecemeal and in some areas highly contested. And a big question that we posed in the report is what we really don't know is when and where to switch from incremental to transformative adaptation. And finally, the key knowledge needs identified at the end of the chapter. There are many knowledge needs, of course, but these are the key ones. 
to reduce uncertainty in rainfall projections, uh, the impacts of carbon, elevated carbon dioxide and vegetation and ocean acidification and how that will interact with climate uh, to affect risk. The key thresholds for rapid change where we may get um, rather irreversible change once we cross some sort of tipping point and we really don't understand these but almost any system. How climate will interact with other drivers of socio-economic change Ageing populations, of course, being one of them. We really don't understand yet the capacity for either human or natural systems to undergo the sorts of transformational adaptation that will likely be required. And finally, the impacts of climate mitigation and adaptation in other parts of the world will have an enormous impact on Australia, and these are very, very difficult to predict at present. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your patience.